So welcome to this Restoration Church online gathering. Um, I invite you throughout this time, like I've shared in the past weeks, take a moment, write things in the comments. If there's a question you have or an insight that God's given you, if there's a specific Bible verse that comes to mind, please put that out in the comments. Uh, this is much like a home church experience where even though we can't fit 200 people into my house uh, by the wonders of technology, you're here at my kitchen table this morning. So I want to hear from you. At different points in the service, I'll pause and look at the comments and, and hopefully interact and dialogue with them, um, as well as Bill Moore, our assistant pastor, who is serving as our online usher. Um, as we seek to tune our hearts to God's grace this morning, I want us to begin with a reading uh, from, uh, from Psalms, from Psalm 34. This psalm has been an encouragement to me, and it's definitely a psalm which helps us refocus uh, on God this morning. Hear these words from Psalm 34. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Now listen to verse 8. I love this verse. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. All week, as we've been leading up to this worship service, I've been praying and asking that God would help you to see again how wonderful he is, to taste and see that he is good. And for some of us, it may be a first time we've tasted the goodness of God. For others, my prayer is that it would be a reawakening of that, that taste of that goodness of God, much like coming back to a meal that you haven't had in a long time. Or for others, You've tasted and seen that the Lord is good every day of your life. And my prayer for you is that today would be another day where you wake up to his amazing grace for you. So let me pray for us as we move into our time of worship. Let's pray. Father in heaven, help us this morning to see you with fresh eyes. God, thank you that we are not here by accident. God, that you have drawn us into this online worship gathering to taste and see that you are good. I thank you for these words from Psalm 34. Thank you that you are the God who delivers. Thank you that you are the God who knows our fears and speaks to those fears. And throughout the words of, throughout the Bible says, do not be afraid. So in the midst of anxiety, in the midst of uncertainty, Lord, we this morning turn our eyes towards you again. And we ask God that you would give us a fresh sense of your power, your promises, and your grace. And so we commit this worship service to you. We give our hearts to you. We look forward to what you're going to do. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. We're now going to move over to our worship studio where Charlene Libby and Mary Grace Libby are going to lead us um, in praise songs. Good morning. Our first song is called Behold Him. It was introduced last week, so it may be kind of new. So just um, listen, sing if you get it. And just um, let these words sink in this morning as we worship together. You was before there was light. Walk across the pages of time. He who made every living thing. Behold him. He who heard humanity's cry Left his throne to wake us a child He became like the least of us Behold him Jesus, Son of God, Messiah The Lamb, the roaring lion Oh, be Behold him. He who 
dine with sinners and saints. Heal the blind, the lost, and the lame. Even now he is in our midst. Behold him. He who chose a criminal's end, paid with blood to settle our debt. Very death as he rose to life. Behold him, Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb, the roaring lion. Oh, be still and behold him, Jesus. Grace is going to lead our next song, and it's one we've done before, but it's been a little while, and I don't know that we've done it a whole lot. The song is called We've Got This Hope, and hope is something we could all um, look for and cling to during this time, and if this is a song that resonates with you and you want to hear it throughout the week and let it get inside your head and your heart a little bit more, it was originally recorded by Ellie Holcomb, and you can probably find it on Spotify and all the other places, but we've got this hope.
are falling even when the night is calling oh, 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 oh. we've got this oh, 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 oh. Promises that he's made. And even when our hearts are breaking, even when our souls are shaking, oh, oh, oh we've got this. Oh, 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 even when the tears are falling, even when the night is calling, oh, 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 oh we've got this. Oh, 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 oh. Boy, what a great set of songs. Uh, and that, that song of even, yeah, even when we face our fears, there is hope. And uh, that's why we're here. That's why we gather. We gather in the name of Christ to look to him for living hope. Um, I have a couple of updates for you and a couple of announcements as we continue in our worship service. That right now, as a church, you know, our mission statement is, with love, we embrace life together as we multiply deeper relationships in Christ. What we mean by that is, as a church, we exist. We want to help you connect and grow deeper in your relationship with God and to connect and grow deeper in your relationship with others so that we can both receive God's grace and share God's grace into this world. And so there's lots of ways that we do that. And I want to give a couple announcements towards that end. First uh, is through uh, is a women's event called Deeper. These events have been Saturday morning teachings in the past. And now that we're shifting things online, uh, it's going to be a Wednesday on Wednesday, May 27th, it'll be uh, at 7.30 p.m. The Zoom will open at 7.15 p.m. Uh, this is a great opportunity to engage in biblical teaching, um, shared conversations. There's going to actually be breakout rooms, uh, so there's going to be small group time. So if you are newer to our church, this is a great way to get to know other women in our church. If you have been around forever, this is a great way to go deeper in those relationships. So you can register by simply uh, texting the word DEEPER uh, to our church management team's number, which is 804-362-0052. Text DEEPER to that number to register. Uh, another opportunity we have is recognizing that uh, we normally would want to set up a photo booth at Oak Knoll Middle School to have a, a picture taken on this Mother's Day, that instead we want to bring the picture taking to you. And so we're offering porch pictures uh, portraits is what we're calling them and so if you can uh, we're going to have those pictures taken still tomorrow and tuesday uh, if you would want uh, one of our uh, one of our photographers amateur photographers but they do a great job to come to your home simply text the word porch to that same number 804-362-0052 and you can register and we'll send someone to take a picture of your family uh, as a gift to you um you know, I want to take a moment to also thank you. Thank you again for your generous giving to our Extend Hope uh, uh, opportunities that we've had to, to support frontline workers. Uh, last week, uh, we took some of those funds and we blessed Tina Goodwin and her team at RVA Pediatrics. Um, it was a wonderful way to, to share the love of Christ through providing meals and, and providing a tangible help to, uh, during this season for those who are on the front lines. And so uh, thank you for your your contributions to that. Uh, it was through Venmo. You could still do that to our Venmo account and simply put hashtag extend hope and that money will go towards supporting frontline workers. Um, as you know, hopefully you know by now we're in a, our missions team has put together a three week rhythm where we're seeking to bless our community and to extend hope during this pandemic time. And so uh, one week we're focusing on local restaurants. Another week we're focusing on on, on, on frontline workers and the third week we're focusing on blessing our neighbors and so this past week was blessing our neighbors and i've heard stories of many of you who've gone on prayer walks or stepped up to help out your neighbors in tangible ways by maybe cutting their lawns or doing yard work others uh, providing gifts uh, it's been a great way to bless our neighbors some of you have heard about uh, we trialed out a prayer truck this past week going into king's charter 
and praying for the entire neighborhood, um, every single mailbox, except for one street where there were tons of cars and a bunch of kids riding bikes. And I, I did not want to drive our sprinter right down that street and potentially run over children. So we, that's the only street we missed, but we went to every other mailbox to pray for every household in King's Charter. And what a great job by Bob and Claudia Dickerson, uh, Sandy Rest, Beth Boston, others who reached out to their neighbors to invite them to that prayer time or to simply uh, to off, ask for prayer requests. Uh, and so that's, that was this past week. As we move into this upcoming week, uh, we move back toward into back and through the rhythm. We're going to begin uh, again of blessing a local business. In fact, this week for blessing restaurants and doing a reverse fundraiser, we're not working with one restaurant, we're working with two. And so we're going to seek to bless Rise and Shine Diner and the Salty Pig. And so uh, Rise and Shine Diner, we've talked to them, our missions team talked to them and found out that their lowest time during the week is actually Monday at lunch, tomorrow for lunch. And so tomorrow we invite you to bring your business, uh, get a takeout order from Rise and Shine Diner and support them tomorrow for lunch. Um, and then the next reverse fundraiser will be on Tuesday with the Salty Pig. We talked to them and, and they said that their lowest time is Tuesday night for dinner. And so consider this week one way to bless our community and bless the local businesses to bring your business to them either Monday at lunch with Rise and Shine or Tuesday dinner with the Salty Pig. All of this, um, all of this would not be able to happen apart from your generous giving. And so again, this week I say thank you. Thank you for your faithful, generous giving. Um, you, by your giving of financial gifts to our church, are keeping our church strong and are allowing us to not only be a blessing to one another, but to be a blessing into our community, especially through these Extend Hope initiatives. And so we're going to take a moment now to slow down, um, to pray, and to pray for our offering, um, to pray that God would use this offering so that we can be that blessing. Um, and so for that, there is, as a reminder, there are four ways you can give to our church. One is to go to our website, restorationrva.org, and click the donate button and, and simply follow the instructions there. Other way is to text that same phone number, 804-362-0052, to text the word give and follow the instructions, or to give through Venmo, which is by giving to at restoration-church-1 and simply putting the word tithe in the comments. And lastly, you could always write a check and mail it to the church office. Um, those are ways you can give. And as we go to this time of prayer, uh, Again, this is not just a time for us to give of our financial resources, but a chance for us to slow down and offer ourselves afresh to God this morning. Um, and not only will we pray for the offering, but we'll pray for the sermon that will begin in a couple minutes. Um, so I invite you to pray with me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your incredible grace, your amazing grace. That um, incredible hymn that will last forever, Lord. Uh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Lord, your grace is truly amazing. And you pour out your grace abundantly. And as your children, Lord, as we receive your gifts, Lord, you allow us to then share those gifts with others. And so I pray, Lord, as we give of our tithes and offerings this morning, I pray that as, as these offerings and are given, that you would receive these gifts, that you would multiply these gifts for your impact, both here in this community in Richmond and around the world. God, that we would be a blessing to one another and that we would be a blessing to our local community. And God, that many would see and know, Lord, how good you are because of our shared service in Christ for this community. And so receive these gifts and receive our hearts, Lord. May we recommit ourselves to you. And Lord, as we turn to the sermon now, I ask God that you would teach us now from your word. I ask God that you would give us receptive hearts and minds to your love and to your grace and to your truth. Thank you, God, for your word, your word, which doesn't return to you empty. It accomplishes its purpose. So I ask God that you would accomplish your work in our lives through this time of this sermon. Now I pray in Jesus name. Amen. All right. This morning, uh, I want us to start with a question. And I invite you, as always, to share this in the comments. I'd love to see, uh, hear about your experiences. Uh, the first experience, the question I have is, what was your first experience with the Bible? Or maybe based on your memories, as you think about your life, what was the initial experience with the Bible? Um, it could be maybe from a church experience, no doubt, or maybe from a relative, maybe your parents, grandparents, 
other relative. Maybe it was from a friend. Maybe it was a positive experience. Maybe it was a negative experience. Uh, what was your initial experience with the Bible? Um, I've shared with you, uh, if you've been with Restoration Church over the years, uh, you've probably heard some of my story that I, I grew up going to church every single week. And so on this Mother's Day, it's a shout out to my mom that my mom took no prisoners. Every single Sunday, we were going to church, not only to the worship service, but also to Sunday school. And to be honest with you, my memories growing up, that's not something I really liked. If you were to ask, you know, first or second grade, little Jeff Lee, if he liked church, the answer would be absolutely no. Um, in fact, um, I've shared a story in the past where uh, I recall we were out late night, at well, late one night, I think visiting with a family in New York City or out in Pennsylvania, and we got home late. And so I remember going to sleep and waking up and thinking, it's Sunday morning, it's time to go to church. But for some reason, it was, it was later in the morning. And uh, I was like, wow, why, why, wonder why we didn't go to church. So I went down, and I remember talking to my mom and saying, Mom, why aren't we going to church? And she said, Jeff, I went into your room and uh, your bed was almost still perfectly made. It's, it's as if you didn't move all night long. It, you slept so deeply. I didn't have it in my heart to wake you up. And so I remember uh, taking note of that and thinking the next Saturday, well, okay, if that's the case, then I'm going to wake up earlier, make my bed, and slip onto the covers so that just perhaps my mom would open the door, see the same scene, and not wake me up. Well, the next week I did that. I set my alarm early, made my bed, crawled back into bed. My mom came in, time to go to church. Oh, it didn't work. Next week, did the same thing. Didn't work. The third week, same thing. Didn't work. So then I asked my mom, I said, mom, 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 hey, I remember asking her saying, remember what you said a couple weeks ago, how deeply I slept and how my covers didn't move. And because of that, you didn't wake me up to go to church. Uh, you know, I've been sleeping pretty well the last couple weeks. Why, why did you wake me up? She said, Jeff, you know how thin these walls in this house are? I could hear your alarm going off. And I know that you've been making your bed and slipping yourself back into it. So uh, there's no excuses. We're going to church, right? And so that's a, that's a picture of my mom in terms of going to church, but also how much I didn't like church. In fact, I recall my getting my first Bible. In fact, I found this. Uh, this is in a, in, a, in a box. This is the first Bible I received in third grade, right? It's uh, in the front. It says presented to Jeffrey Lee the Presbyterian Church School from New Providence, New Jersey. It's part of New Providence Presbyterian Church. And there's the note, Jeffrey, I hope you use and enjoy your Bible. Love, Mr. Tool, October 14th, 1984. All right? So, uh, yeah, Mr. Tool, Tom Tool was my first pastor, and here's the Bible I got in third grade. Now, there's a lot of maybe memories with this Bible, but I remember my friends and I, we called this the Thou Art Bible the Thou Art Bible, because we didn't understand, felt like we didn't understand anything inside of it. Now, this wasn't old King James language, but for us, we still called it the Thou Art Bible, and it, it really made little sense. It was confusing. In many ways, it was boring. Now, I do remember memorizing all the books of the Bible, because if we memorized the books of the Bible, we would get a prize, and so I, I remember doing that. Uh, but in really, in many ways, the Bible was like a foreign language that was confusing and boring, and it continued that way for years. Um, let's see, what are some of the things, what are some of your initial interactions with the Bible? Uh, I love Dave Corbin, trying to read a thick book where the characters talked funny, as was a little bit of my experience. Um, yeah, Bill, looking at the maps and pictures, this Bible has some of those. A lot of you put things like Sunday school and VBS, things like sword drills and Awana, like that. Yeah, sword drills. Yeah, continue to put your experiences in there. It's so interesting to hear about um, different ways that people experience the Bible. Um, the Bible Bowl. Wow, Lee Wilkins. Man, I want to be part of the Bible Bowl. Of all the different football bowls, I haven't heard of the Bible Bowl yet. Maybe we need to start that again as a church. Those are some of your experiences. You know, for millions of people, millions of people over thousands of years, right? God's love and his grace and his truth in the Bible have transformed their lives. You know, the message and the good news that's found, right, in this book has come to people and by the power of God has impacted and transformed their lives. And even for me as a third grader, maybe it was confusing and boring. Over the years, that hasn't been the case for millions and millions of Christians. 
And so today I want us to consider why that's the case. What happened um, not only in the first century, but thinking about how that applies to us in the 21st century. And to do that, we're going to consider uh, the living hope that's found in Christ. And we're continuing to look at that topic as we continue in our study of 1 Peter this morning. 1 Peter. And with that is going to be an emphasis on the living and enduring Word of God, uh, the Word that can change our lives. And so I'm going to read this morning from, we're going to continue right through the book of 1 Peter, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, uh, verses chapter 2, verse 3. Hear the word of God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass. And all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Right here we get a picture of these first century Christians, right? Peter's writing this letter to those who are loved and chosen and by God, and as we read in chapter 1, who are elect. They're also those who are scattered, right? And so they're, and they're exiles, right? He's writing to them, and in the midst of this, he's reminding them of the impact and power of God's work on their life. The impact and power of the gospel, right? The good news about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the middle of this passage, in verse 25, we get a glimpse of how God's word impacted them. Because here Peter says, this is the word that was preached to you. Right, preach not in the form maybe of me, like, like I am preaching to you now or preaching like in a big auditorium, but the proclamation, the sharing, like the sounding of a wonderful message, right? This proclamation of this amazing news about Jesus. Jesus, who is more than a good person, more than a teacher, more than a prophet, but was the son of God who took the sins of the world on himself, died on a Roman cross, was buried, and on the third day was resurrected from the dead overcoming all sin, evil, and death itself. And that if the belief of those events, the belief in a God who did that for them, it would lead to a brand new life, a new life in Christ. So what do we learn about what happened to them from this passage? Right, We see in verse 22 that they had been purified, purified by obeying the truth. Right, Verse 22, we read, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth. Right, this is a description of responding to Jesus or responding to the good news or gospel message about him. Right? This purified them. Right? The way you think about purification means getting rid of what's dirty. Right? In, in the Old Testament context, this would have no doubt focused on like washing the washing of hands before going into worship. There's a way of making yourself ready and prepared to meet with God. And so it was a way to be able to draw near to God. Here, Peter's saying, Right? By obeying the truth, by responding to Jesus, they've become purified, meaning that they are now able to grow closer to God, to come near to God. Right? This phrase, obeying the truth, you think about Jesus, and he describes himself in John 14, 14, 6. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So obeying the truth, in essence, is obeying Jesus, where truth is not merely a set of ideas. But the truth is a person, and the person is Jesus. And here, as they've responded to Jesus, who he is and his very character, responded to his name, they've been purified. What else? Well, we look in verse 23 that we read that they have been born again, right? They've been given new life, right? That not physically going back into their mother's room and being reborn, but that they are, that the spirits, their spirits which were dead because of sin, have been regenerated. They've, been, they've come to life, and they've received this new life, a new life that starts now and lasts forever. Right? How does life come about? It says, not by what is 
perishable, meaning things of this world, which eventually will perish, but by something that's imperishable. And that something is the living and enduring word of God. The living and enduring word of God. What's living about it, right? You just think about the living word of God, meaning it's not dead. It's not just words on a page. It's not how I saw this Bible when I was in third grade, just a bunch of dead words, but it's a, a living message about a living Lord who is resurrected from the dead and who provides new life, who provides hope to hopeless situations, who restores and brings together what's dead and brings it to life, right? He takes what's broken and puts it back together, right? It's a living word. Like we read in Hebrews 4, verse 12, we read that the, the word of God is living and active. Right? It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It, it, it penetrates and divides soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Where we read in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all scripture is God-breathed. Right? It's inspired by God and it's useful for teaching and correcting and rebuking and training in righteousness. That this word is alive, that it's not dead words on a page, but it, it points to Jesus and allows us to connect with him in a way that brings new life, brings life out of death and restores what's broken. Those are a couple of Bible verses that have been encouraged to, have encouraging me. What are some Bible verses that have been encouraging to you as you think about your walk? I invite you to put that in the comments and in, in the chat feature here. Just write down verses that have, that have brought life to you so that others who are tuning in this morning, they could ha have a set of verses that they can go to as a go-to uh, go set of verses. So this word is living, but it's also enduring. The description is the living and enduring word of God. What does it mean to endure? It means to stick close to you, to stay by you. It reminds me of God's promise that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. And if the word of God doesn't leave us, it's like a close friend or a close family member or someone that you can count on that's going to stick with you through the thick and thin through tough times like a pandemic, the enduring word of God and the promises of God don't leave us. And that's the living and enduring word of God is what brought new life to these early Christians in the first century. And as we read in verse 25, it's the word that was preached or proclaimed to them. So what was the result of this? Right? No doubt they were received a new life in Christ, but also resulted in a new set of relationships. We read back in verse 22 that they now have a sincere love for each other. Right? This description, sincere love, it, it underneath there's different words for love in the Greek language. And this one is, is phileo, which is where we get Philadelphia or brotherly love. It's a family love, it's a sense of fellowship. They say now because of that they've been purified, now because that they've been born again or have a new life, that they are also born into a new family, adopted into a family where they have sincere love for one another, for each other. And therefore, there's a call to action. The call to action is to love one another deeply. How? Peter says, from the heart. From the heart, right? The heart, which is the core of our being, right? It's out of the heart that everything flows. Jesus said, for out of the heart, the mouth speaks. In many ways, out of the, from out of the heart, all of our actions flow. So here we're saying, Peter's saying, love one another deeply from the heart in this new relationship. So how is this to happen? Well, it involves a transformation of the heart. It involves a constant restoration of our hearts. Right? And so in chapter two, verse one, we get a glimpse into how we can step into it. God does the work, but what's our role in, in joining up with him in that work? He says, get rid, get rid of all malice, get rid of all deceit, get rid of hypocrisy and envy and slander. Right? All of these actions are actions that kill relationships. Right? Malice, when you have ill wills towards someone. Hypocrisy, when you wear different masks around different people. Right? You think about slander, when you, whether you slander someone to their face or if you slander someone behind their back. Right? Speaking negatively about them when they're not in the room. All of these hurt relationships. Peter's saying, get rid of all of these. Clear the way. In essence, he like, says, put them off, take them off, like taking off a, a dirty shirt. Right? It makes me think of after I mow the lawn and, it's, and I'm sweaty and it's, and it's like there's grass and dirt all over me. I just want to just change my clothes. Put, Peter's saying, get, just take off that dirty garment. Get rid of this stuff. Now, typically, like the Apostle Paul and other New Testament writers, when they say get rid of a series of vices, then they say put on a series of virtues. Peter doesn't do that here. He, instead, he points his readers and listeners to a greater dependence on God. And there he says, like new, 
He says, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk. I love this image. What a picture. Right, a picture of, of God's word of, of reading scripture as being pure spiritual milk. Right, pure in the sense that it's not watered down, pure in the sense that it, 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 it nourishes, it helps grow. You think about a baby, a newborn baby who cries out for food, cries out because he or she is hungry, right? And, and that the milk that that baby drinks in is perfectly formulated for that baby to grow and to grow strong and to be healthy. Here, Peter draws upon that image. Right, in other places, in Hebrews and Corinthians, sometimes milk is seen as something negative where he says, move on to solid food. That's not the focus here. The focus is more the craving, right? To crave this pure spiritual milk, right? to have this posture of saying, God, I want more. Give me more of it. Saying that you're crying out for it, that you need it, that you long for it, that you realize that it alone can truly satisfy. And what's this based on? Well, Peter finishes in verse 3, echoing what we read in the beginning of this worship service. He says, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Peter's reminding them that they have tasted this, and it's tasted so good. And how he's saying, go nurture those taste buds, right? Go feed well on the Word of God and nurture those spiritual taste buds, right? These early Christians were impacted by the Word, right? The message impacted them, and this living and enduring Word of God was changing their lives because they responded to that word. Ultimately, they responded to Jesus himself, the news about him, and it changed their lives. And in that, they were given a hunger for God and a hunger for his word. So what about me? Years later, right? I didn't stay in third grade forever, thank goodness, right? The Thou Art Bible, which was boring. Uh, When I became a Christian freshman year in high school, and I've shared some of that story before, the part that I haven't shared as deeply is the impact it had in terms of my love for God's word. Because When I gave my life to Christ, when I heard this good news that Jesus died for the forgiveness of my sins and that I didn't have to be perfect for God to love me and that I could rest in his finished work for me on the cross and that I could become a child of God. When I gave my life to Christ, responded to that message, something happened. I can't explain it. I believe it's supernatural, that God gave me new spiritual taste buds. In fact, my mom, I remember she went and we bought a a NIV study Bible. In fact, this is the same cover of that study Bible that I had when I was a freshman in high school. There's a different NIV study Bible inside because the first one, that that first Bible, I wore it out. And in fact, it fell apart and it broke into all different kinds of pieces. I just wore that thing out. So this is a Bible that she had and she gave it to me, but this is the same cover. I remember even just holding this brings back memories of the first times I was reading God's word and I couldn't get enough. It was like craving pure spiritual milk, not only the verses, but the notes on the bottom, trying to learn more. And so I encourage you, if the Bible is confusing to you, to get a study Bible, right? Because the notes can help you understand what they're talking about. The introductions at the beginning of the chapters can help you understand the context of the, of the different letters and writings. The maps in the back, I saw that you know, Bill was saying how he remembers when his first interactions with the Bible were the charts and the pictures and the maps. Those are helpful to get a context of the different lands and things that were happening. But for me, this was pure spiritual milk of which I was able to feed on and begin growing in my faith in Christ. Um, And it's continued to this day. It's continued to this day. I still love God's word. Sure. I mean, there's days sometimes that it's dry. Some days I don't want to read it, but there's a lot of days when I'm like, I can't wait to get to it. In fact, when I get into God's word every single day, when I, when I don't open it, I miss it. I miss it. I feel like something's missing. It's like missing breakfast. I'm a big breakfast guy. And if I miss breakfast, my whole body feels off. That's what it's like when I don't read God's word. And that's my prayer for you. If you're watching this day, you may be like, Jeff, that is so far from my experience. Whether you, maybe you're an atheist or agnostic, and you're like, I don't even care. This is a bunch of fables and don't even waste my time. I invite you to read any of the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and spend some time with Jesus and get a sense of the heart of God through what's recorded there. Maybe you're someone who's read the Bible, but it's become dry and boring. I invite you to dive back in. Maybe you're someone who's been reading the Bible every single day, and it's been a lifeline for you. Keep up with it, because that's how you grow up in your faith. And this living hope that we've been talking about in 1 Peter, that's how that hope grows. And it grows and strengthens as you both read, study, and digest God's word, which is food for us.
So I ask, what about you? As we now move to the first century, how have you embraced the hope of Jesus that's available to you? How have you made yourself available to the wonderful truths, uh, the stories of real people like you and me that interacted with God, um, the wonderful psalms and prayers, even the poetry that you see at different aspects, different parts, the words of praise and doxology that you see? How have you made yourself available to the living and enduring word of God that ultimately we receive in Christ that we also receive as we read his word. Um, as we do, I believe God grows and strengthens our relationship with him. And I also believe God grows and strengthens our love for other people. Because we saw with these first century Christians, Peter's saying, you have a sincere love for each other. And he says, therefore, love one another deeply from the heart. Do you want a transformed heart? You want a heart that becomes more loving, more loving and warm towards God, more loving and warm towards other people? Part of that picture is the discipline and opportunity of reading God's word, his living and enduring word every single day. Now, this taste may not be a natural taste for you. That's okay. In many ways, it's a supernatural taste. It's something that it's completely okay to ask God to give you a desire to read his word. So if you're finding, you know, this, the Bible's boring. It's, I don't even know where to begin. First, I encourage you to simply ask God to not make it boring, um, to, to, to look and see the, the potential of the adventure of getting to know God. Much like when you meet someone for the first time and you start to ask questions about them and get to know them, that's what it's like coming to the Bible. And so God invites your questions. He invites, as you read and, and, and go through his scripture, that you get to know him more as you engage. And don't do it alone. You could do it with other people as well. And in, the, in that dialogue, you can hear what they're learning and you can share what you're learning. And it really brings the Bible to life in lots of different ways. So what are some ways that we can do this? How can we commit to this as a church family and beyond if you're tuning in with us? First, again, I, ask, I say that first for all of us to ask or to ask God again to give us spiritual taste buds that long to, to drink deeply from his word, like newborn babies to crave pure spiritual milk um, that could truly satisfy the soul level desires and hungers that you have. God alone can meet those desires. So ask God for help with that. Second is to commit to drinking God's word every single day, every single day, to make it a habit, right? At first, it may, it's just like any discipline, whether it's exercise or eating or anything that goes against our natural way of doing things. Commit to doing it every single day and even start small. Uh, recently, a, a, a neighbor of ours gave us a, a copy of Runner's World, and, and it was interesting that it talked about this idea of a streak, right, of running one mile every single day in order to just to ha have that taste of running and all the benefits that come from that streak. You think about social media and different accounts and how they have streaks when you check in or do something every single day. How about with reading God's Word? But this is not legalism. This is not a way to gain God's favor. This is simply a way to put yourself in a place to receive God's grace, right? To drink deeply of God's word. So I offer you a challenge. I call it the seven by seven challenge, right? Take either read seven verses or spend seven minutes in God's word every day for the next seven days. The seven by seven challenge, right? Again, take either seven verses or read for seven minutes. Like if you read a gospel, I I invite you to start with maybe the Gospel of Mark or take Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John if you want to get back into the Bible. Start reading maybe that seven minutes because it's more of a story. Or if you're reading a thicker book like First Peter, it just, it just happens that this passage that we consider today is seven verses, right? So take these seven verses and read them slowly. So for the next seven days, either read seven verses or take seven minutes in God's Word. I invite you to do that in the morning before you get going in the day. Some of you may not be morning people. That's fine. Maybe do it later. But for me, it's best when my mind is clear. Seven by seven. And over time, man, I invite you and even challenge you to increase that. Increase that up to 20 minutes and see what happens. Right? We've been told we need to wash our hands for 20 seconds to make sure they're clean. Right? And we need clean hands. But ultimately, what we really need are clean hearts. And so it takes more than 20 seconds. So I say instead of 20 seconds of washing your hands, think about moving all the way up to 20 minutes of letting God wash your heart, 
right? We're all looking for hand sanitizer. Deep inside, we need a heart sanitizer. We need God to clean our heart so we can love each other deeply from the heart, right? So start with that seven by seven challenge. See if God can increase that capacity over time. Let's keep it simple for this week. Seven days taking seven verses or seven minutes of reading to let God work. I believe that God will increase your love for him, your craving for him and for his word, and that he will continue to grow you up in Christ, to grow your hope, the living hope that he's given us. Um, He's given us that new birth into a living hope through Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. May we embrace that hope by reading his word, the living and enduring word of God. A couple other things I do want to share is uh, that's what you could do, the seven by seven challenge on your own. I invite you to any of our online gatherings throughout the week, whether it's the midweek prayer at noon, or uh, there's men's groups that meet on Tuesday, Thursday, Friday morning over Zoom. There's women's groups, the Glory Girls meet Tuesday morning. There's the deeper event I mentioned at the end of the month, May 27th, Wednesday evening. There's other online gatherings for children, right? Story time, other ways to connect with Christian Moore, our children's director. For our youth, right? In terms of Zoom on Sunday nights or other gatherings, I invite you to connect online as a way to nurture those spiritual taste buds um, and to receive encouragement along the way. So again, seven by seven challenge, find something online. You can go to our website, restorationrva.org and you'll see the full listing of our online gatherings. Check into one, click into one of those this week. I, we'd love to see you there to help nurture your faith in Christ. Um, as we complete, let me pray for us and pray for this as we consider what it would mean for us to continue to taste and see that the Lord is good through the daily reading of his word. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you have given us the gift of your word. Ultimately, your word is is Jesus who came full of grace and truth. In your word, the Bible, which is the written word, which points to him, the living Lord Jesus. I pray, God, that you would give every single one of us either a new or renewed love for your word. God, we need hope. And in the midst of this pandemic time, in the midst of so many questions around this nation and anxieties and fears and uncertainties, thank you, Lord, for the hope that we have in Christ, which as we read in Hebrews, is an anchor for our soul. Lord, your word provides those promises. Your word provides that hope. Your word is living and enduring, and it stays with us and reminds us, God, that you never leave us nor forsake us. So I pray for every single person, God, that you would allow us every single day this week to spend either seven minutes or read seven verses for the next seven days. And to also consider clicking into one of our online gatherings this week so that we can nurture these, these spiritual taste buds so we can continue to learn to live into the living hope that we've received in Christ. I pray for this all in the powerful and matchless name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. So we turn it back over uh, to the worship studio as we continue in worship through songs. Just sit and wait for all your goodness. Hope to feel your presence. And I could just stay. I could just stay right where I am and hope to feel you. Hope to feel something again. me from the 
song today um, and this is one that is familiar to our congregation one that we've all heard a few times so I know it can feel awkward and alone um, sometimes feeling so separated from everyone but this song is a chance for us all together in our own places to worship to join together in song and sing words that unite us um, and I will, if, if you're kind of worried about sounding weird, I guarantee you the people you have been quarantined with have heard that voice of yours plenty. So you might as well just sing out and worship together. We're going to sing Fill My Life. Your heart and lead me in your love. 
Man, I love that last song. Love all the songs. Thank you, Mary Grace. Thank you, Charlene, for leading us this morning. Uh, thank you to the tech team, for Eric Walter, for his service and of getting everything set up, making sure everything connects and works together. And, and boy, what a great way to end this service, right? To this song, in many ways, built on the words of Jesus from the end of the Sermon on the Mount, right? That we will seek to build our life on him because he is worthy. Uh, I invite you as we finish uh, now for a couple things. One, to come to the midweek prayer. It's on Wednesday at noon. You can get information on our website, restorationrva.org, to click into that at Wednesday for a prayer time at noon. And, and after the service, there's a Zoom meeting. Uh, our assistant pastor, Bill Moore, will be there to answer any questions you have, uh, pray with you, uh, dialogue about the sermon or anything from this morning. So uh, you'll see that in the comments, uh, a link to that. And we're going to keep the live event going for a little bit longer uh, with the announcements. You'll see some announcements, slides, and I'll be also hanging around uh, commenting on the comments as well. Um, I love looking at the comments. Thank you for participating today. Uh, we would not have a morning without the Bible, without Dave Gorban waving it, weighing in with to keep your head in the bread. And so that's my encouragement and call to you this week to keep your head in the bread. Take the seven by seven challenge, right? Whether it's seven minutes or seven verses for the next seven days, and also click into one of our online gatherings this week to help nurture your spiritual taste buds. Let me finish with this word from John 6.35. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And may we bring our soul-level hunger and thirst to God this week. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace now and in the days and weeks and months and years ahead and forever. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Go in peace.